morning everybody how are we doing today uh, it's a Wednesday morning I am rather exhausted and tired I spent the whole day yesterday with my brother installing heat ducts into this room and another room and then this main trunk that we had to shoot branches up into the upstairs floor so we actually have heat in the whole building now that's distributed closer to properly uh, this room is very cold in the winter, extremely hot in the summer. Uh, I mean, it's tough just to sit down here and hang out sometimes, it was so cold. Uh, we had a, a trunk that was wide open that we just had never got to, we ran out of money and time. And uh, my brother Tim came over yesterday, and thanks to him very much for helping us get this main trunk right here, I'll show you. That guy right there. Uh, and it shoots through into that room into a back room, which is actually the other part of the lounge. Uh, <clears throat> so the lounge now is, is warm, comfortable. Everything was cleaned. Everything was blissful, to be honest. There's the 10 inch case. Uh, I just want to talk to you real quick before we jump into a couple records here about the idea of jazz. What is jazz? You know, where does that inspiration come from? Uh, there's also some new t-shirts available on the site, by the way, Jazz Vinyl Club, the Facebook group. But uh, jazz is such a misunderstood art form. <clears throat> and I think we come from a rock and roll background so often and we hear the virtuosity of the blues through the rock and roll lens where it becomes a lot more uh, self-boasting and egotistical and look how great I am and then we get into jazz and we start to hear <clears throat> the virtuosity and we kind of get lost and we, we lose the blues essentially and that deeper connection with the meaning of the music and I've discussed before uh, how when we approach music do we approach it as a guy who wants a mint Ming vase on a shelf that's going to be worth tens of thousands of dollars and priceless this is my little girl little butt She's my little cuddle buddy. We take naps together almost every day. Uh, <clears throat> she was trying to climb onto the camera because cats will do what cats wish to do. They're not much one for doing what they're told to do. But that in part is the story of jazz. <clears throat> if you approach it from a mink vase standpoint and you want that showpiece on your shelf and you don't even really appreciate the culture or the language that was spoken through that boss. It's great that you can afford to have the piece on your shelf, but I think sometimes you lose connection with it, even though you have this mint, pristine version of it. And the archaeologists can find pottery shards and find all kinds of insight into the creator of that piece. Art in general is supposed to give you some insight into the person who creates it. <clears throat> and people often question some of my theories on art and expression and jazz and personality. And uh, even some of my takes on Miles Davis, they're not just A, my personal opinions. You know, I, I start off as the biggest Miles Davis fan in the world. But the stories pile, pile up of the times he was just a real less than nice guy. You know, there's a lot of uh, Kenny Drew punch. You know, uh, he treats Red Garland really poorly. He treats a lot of musicians really poorly. Uh, I don't think he was a super well-liked guy. But his personality, his insecurity, his uh, lack of a community around him, 
all informs us something about who he is. We know people with insecurity who overcompensate with large ego. We know how difficult they can be. <clears throat> and now let's factor in the photographs of the man. And I think it's incredibly insightful to take a look at 10, 12 photographs of an artist's face, especially a jazz musician. And the candid photographs of Frank Wolf are great because they're not posing. There's no way a guy's putting a mug on or trying to be anything besides what he is. Uh, of course, Miles wasn't a blue note guy very long, but uh, there's Miles is one of the most photographed guys in, in the history of jazz music. And there are some pictures of him smiling and relaxing and having a good time, but the guy had a lot of stress and some demons. And the stress of his success wore on him in the later years. And by later years, I mean post culturing You know, I think I think of the stress of trying to still be cutting edge and successful. And then the Columbia contract was a, a heavy mantle with which he had a lot of expectation placed upon him. And I think he handles it with aplomb in some cases. But uh, the notion of Miles Davis' personality... Again, if you show me 10, 12 photographs of anybody, I will give you some insight on who that person is. Tell you what they're about. If I showed you 10, 12 pictures of my children, you'd know something about my kids. I'm guaranteeing it. And so you couple together the stories you hear, the personal makeup. Insecure people overcompensate and have egotistical manifestations and are threatened and are wondering who's whispering and who's laughing. What are you laughing about? You laughing to me? What? And those conspiracies can mount in those people's heads to the point where they make everybody else in the room uncomfortable. And I don't think there's much question that a Miles Davis face, his photographs, his expressions, inform us a great deal about how this guy operates, how this guy functions. Uh, <clears throat> my cat, as I was saying, doesn't like to do what he was told. And jazz, for me, is the embodiment of a, a people unwilling to just do what they were told. And there's a music in this art that expresses freedom in such a way, in such a context, that it's hard to really even put it into the language of today unless we've walked a mile in those shoes. <clears throat> but there comes a joy in not just the improvisation, it's you. a lot of times jazz takes you, the captor, the oppressor's music their songs and makes them better. Uh, in, a ra in an act of almost irreverence to the initial material, jazz remixes white Broadway songs and makes them sexual, funky, grooving, blues filled, sorrow storytelling vehicles that they were never intended to be. But there's almost a kind of F you when I take your song and just splash color all over it. I'm taking your Rango, your Monet, your Mona Lisa, and I'm saying, I'm gonna put a mustache on this bitch. I'm gonna color the sky in over here and it ain't dark enough on this side. And watch me give some flavor to that. Watch me reinvent the scream. And Revolution doesn't have an idea of what screaming's like. Let me extend that. And so it's almost a source of, I'm gonna graffiti your monuments. I'm an ancient Babylon in chains as a slave. And you've built this great stone wall with etched carvings of the successful endeavors of Nebuchadnezzar or King Darius in Persia. And those writings often diminish 
the very people in those chains and make them seem like they were an imminent threat to the survival of this kingdom, this empire. And so instead of letting them destroy us, we put them in chains and put them to work for us. Sounds like a convenient storyline that doesn't seem too distant in our own history. And so Jazz takes that monument, that wall, that pyramid, that temple, and pulls out a marker and says, Yeah, motherfucker, what do you think of that? And to make matters worse, the people of the Empire walk by this monument, and a lot of your old people are going, well, I kind of like that better. Huh. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Nebuchadnezzar to begin with. Ashurbanipal kind of is a drag. I don't like all of his policies. How the rabbi got too much arm chopping going off. So, I get that my king built this temple, this monument, and sure, we're sophisticated and grand, but I also don't like that motherfucker either because I got to pay taxes. They arrested my daughter. They put us in the war. They pay tribute. The people often in those empires will see the littlest among them resist in clever ways that they never envisioned or dreamt of. And while they could never relate to being in those chains because they're merchantmen on the streets, they still have a disdain for the emperor. And so Jazz comes along and says, let me take your Gershwin. Let me take your songbook. Shake it upside down, turn it on its head, pick up the tempo, put a little of this to it, and next thing you know, it's got a sexuality I just took your shit that was safe as hell. Church on a Sunday. Old lady's church hat safe. Your stuff was safe, innocent. Asexual. And I said this to it. See what I'm saying? I'm gonna translate, transform, rebirth your art with the graffiti stick of my oppressed mind finding freedom by saying F you to your monument. And that's not to say the captor doesn't have an impressed opinion of the architecture of this grand empire. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon must have been fantastic. Marching into Rome for the first time, even in change, it must have been like, God damn, there's a motherfucker right here. Being taken into Egypt as a Nubian. You must have been like, man, I thought our pyramids were cool, but look at this. So you could still be impressed with the songbook and the, the writers of the American songbook. But still, as Armstrong did, go, y'all didn't do enough of that. See, you built a nice little temple here. But you forgot this minaret, you forgot this dragon's horn. I got a tower I want to put up here. There's a window and look out, and look at that maiden down there. God damn. It's reinventing it. It's an incredible tribute and monument to their existence, to their trouble. And they can look on these great pillars of the empire and the most clever thing about jazz is how discreetly deceptive and liberating and subtle that graffiti is and sure the establishment felt threatened by this black sexuality this good white girls are getting loose to it oh my goodness shut it down Duke Gellington your Far East Sweets got a little bit too much mixed blood for our likings. But that's the beauty of it. You know, it's not protest posters and pamphlets that get burnt and destroyed. It's a subtle, non-spoken resistance and a fight for freedom 
and jazz emotes and evokes so much of the history of the last half millennia. And those people who want to live in a vacuum and not connect the grander pieces of how someone got in the place they were in order to function and operate as they do has no comprehension of the time and space they live in. If your world doesn't exist beyond the own time frame of your experience, your time in that experience is going to be miserable because it lacks all context. You need to have the understanding of who I am and where I come from and the movies of my people and the manipulations of time and currency, economics, people, race, and religion and weave that fabric to help understand the tissue and sinew that connects to my being. What helps define me and what do I not want to define me? What do I not want to identify with? I want to cast off some of the things that were placed on me at birth. And I've often said to my children, and this goes back before them even, the opposite of the, uh, what's the difference between reality? What's the opposite of uh, society? The society you're born into is one way of doing things. The opposite of society is reality. And that's all ways of doing things ever. Reality can't just encompass your way of seeing the timeline of your life scale and even your own ancestry. Reality encompasses every slice, every walk, every being, every culture, every community. That's reality, every way it's ever been done. Not just the way me and my group do things. That's not reality, that's society. And reality is all encompassing all societies that ever have been and ever will be. And so reality is this much broader concept. And so I need to attach reality to my philosophy. I can't allow a flag that has a temporal history to it to find me because it doesn't have enough length to it. That nation's 200 years old at best. And yet a dear friend of mine once said to me, and this is imperialism at work. Our school systems are being decimated. The curriculum is being shredded. There's no history, no geography, no sense of place being taught. And this friend of mine, who is a smart kid on the street, he's a hustler, he was a brilliant kid on some levels, his book smarts were lacking because he was raised in Babylon. And Babylon taught him to say this. Dan, you say you're so smart. You all say you know your history. You said America's like only 250 years old. So then why is it 2008? Because in his mind, his context of reality is his society. He's never grasped, been informed, even envisioned the other societies that encompass reality. If it's 2000, if it's two, America's only 250 years old, why, is it too, why isn't the calendar in American history match up? That's what he's saying. Why if America, why is, like his mind goes Big Bang, dinosaurs, George Washington. That's imperialism. That is how brainwash functions. When you lack empathy and understanding of other groups, it makes you easy to be afraid and controllable. And we live in a context and a political forum now where that's the entire existence is disinformation, a lack of education, and people with opinions voting on issues that aren't even matters of real economic import. The social calendar of our politic is designed completely to split votes and to make the current status quo remain. It's, it's a really frustrating, uh, unstoppable, unreformable system, it seems like at this point. I don't know how we get out of that box. But abortion, those issues, you know, gay marriage, those aren't federal election issues for the most powerful nation on the planet. You know, and most of those issues should be decided between a doctor, uh, a, a wife, a mother, and a family, you know, children. It's, it's family stuff. It's not for the dictation of large government and to, to divide people's morality, make them outraged, and so that they, they sit there divided in these camps. But I don't want to go too far down that road. But jazz is this incredible message of graffiti on the walls of the king and reimagining how the Hanging Gardens of Babylon 
could look, should look. You know what I mean? And here's the thing. Once we reinvented the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, all of a sudden there was a party down in that motherfucker. People was dancing. People was getting it down. Before it was kind of like this, rigid. They had their opera gloves on and they were drinking their lovely teas and crumpet and they were satisfied, and but they were dignified, but they were really bored. Along came this Armstrong cat and they blew it all up. That's what jazz does. It blows up conformity. It blows up tyranny. It blows up opposition to my freedom. And it's a powerful vehicle. We're gonna move on to part two. Uh, part two today. I wanna talk about a really underappreciated album. <clears throat> and it's early Blue Note, not 1539. And it's uh it's a it's a it's a gold mine. It's a, it's a real brilliant album, and it's uh, Young Horse Silver. Shortly after he left the left the Jazz Messengers, and people tend to forget that when he left the Jazz Messengers, he took the Jazz Messengers with him. And it's kind of forgotten that that's the case. Blakey gets a whole new crew in '56 and '57. He's got that that second generation of, of, of jazz messengers there. But in 56, when he's making this, Silver leaves Art, and he takes Hank Mobley with him. He takes Doug Watkins with him. And he takes Donald Byrd with him. And Louis Hayes is now filling the drum chair. And he plays with Horace Silver a long time. And of course, uh, Byrd, and Mobley are gonna go both go on to bigger things of their own, and they re, he replaces them with Blue Mitchell and uh, Junior Reed, I believe it is. It's early in the morning. I had a long day yesterday. Uh, my mind's not pulling up names like it should be. But this first iteration of the Jazz Messengers sounds Blakey essentially. This record is nobility and it kind of goes under the radar for a record that has Hank Mobley on it and Donald Byrd on it and is essentially that other branch of the Jazz Messenger tree. The, the Columbia Jazz Messenger stuff is this with Blakey instead of Hayes. And Silver is just this awesome minimalist player. And he's got some Count Basie in him where he just takes spaces and shapes as needed and colors where he wants and he's capable of playing and filling space when needs be. But even on his leads here, there's lots of breath, lots of thought, contemplative, mm, I like what I just said there, reflection. Uh, he's such an interesting player, Silver. <clears throat> he's so content, but with remaining in the pocket, finding these lines that squiggle and worm and end in interesting places, a bit like Monk at times, but he's very groove oriented, very space oriented. Uh, this is an expensive record, don't get me wrong, but it's not celebrated the same a lot of Blue Notes in this era are, which is a little strange to me, uh, especially when you have Hank Mobley and Donald Bird on it. Uh, Mobley seems to bring records on other labels to higher heights price-wise. And I'm guessing this one still goes for a couple grand for a really nice old copy. This is an old copy that a guy bought in 59, I believe in Minneapolis. In you know, Minneapolis, Minnesota, a guy by the name of Harpole Ellsworth bought this on Clinton Avenue in 1959. And it's uh, first or second pressing from those, uh, those days, uh, the guy, Harpole, sold it to my friend's record store, and he guy contacted me, and I grabbed a few old Blue Notes that day. Uh, this is back probably around 99, 2000, 2001, so it shows you how long, no, no, probably more like 2003, 2004, but my, my Blue Note collection has been pretty extensive for a long time, which means I've had time to digest it all, uh, much more so than some labels. Some labels I'm still kind of actively grasping.
You know, I don't have Savoy's catalog down. I'm still learning it. I know it better than probably than most, but I don't know. I'm not an expert at all the Savoy uh, titles and sounds. I got a pretty good grasp on the first hundred now, you know, but it's it, my Blue Note experience and feel for the eras of the label and the migration of the musicians and the sound that each musician was kind of trying to get and strive for. It's all pretty clear to me at Blue Note. Uh, Mobley's in fine form here, of course. Uh, Bird's actually got a lot of fire and blister to him, and I like the impact Bird always has on Mobley. Uh, and again, it's a great cover. And someone brought this to my attention recently, and it's really true. How come Horace Silver's records are always outside the studio, the album covers? Uh, most Blue Note album covers picture Frank Wolf photographs inside Hackensack Studio recording and just jamming and hanging out. And so Silver must have had something in his contract when he came over from Epic Columbia that said, I want to have uh, photographs as that I want that are a little bit more staged and a little bit more set about town. And there are some of the great album covers. You know, they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, I just love the man's personality. His parents were Cape Verdean, if I recall. And uh, it gives him a different take on the American experience uh, he's got a hint of that, I don't want to call it Mediterranean, and it's not really Latin either, but it certainly has a groove at times that gives you almost a calypso or a subtropical element at times in its groove and its pattern, and when he adds like a, a Congo, it only increases that. Uh, Silver's a giant. And I think he should be celebrated as strongly as a guy like Wayne Shorter. And Shorter gets a lot of love from today's collectors. And rightfully so. Uh, Shorter was a great composer. But Silver's a brilliant composer as well. And uh, Silver's later works maybe aren't as exploratory and as uh, complex maybe as some of what Wayne Shorter, Wayne Shorter's were. But uh, Silver's return to the pocket always... I, I think he's truly one of the giants and needs to have more recognition than he gets. And this has been reissued several different ways, as almost every Blue Note has been. It's a, an absolute masterpiece. And it's, like I said, it's a hidden Blue Note gem, if there is such a thing. Uh, and when I say hidden gem, it's not like some of the Bethlehem where four other people are going to go, oh, I love that record. You know, it's Blue Note, so it's got more light on it. And people are going to be talking about it. But it's certainly one you don't see posted in the Facebook jazz groups. And on the on online, people talking about it the same way they do a lot of the other stuff out there like Soul Station. But I think it should be spoken of much high, more highly than it is and much more frequently than it is. And if you have this record, you know what I'm talking about. It's just fantastic. Uh, I'm going to touch on one more thing here. And this is a record I found in the wild. And it's a tough to find album. And it was one I sat there and debated for a minute do I want to grab it? And I ended up grabbing it because I knew I'd probably never see it again. And it turned out it's a pretty rare United Artists Records by Tiny Grimes. Uh, Tiny's a great guitar player, he goes back along with Bill Jennings into the 40s as kind of one of the R&B crossover, early proto-soul jazz guys. And he plays on a lot of great sessions. Uh, he might be the one that plays the four-string guitar? I can't recall. Uh, it's been a second since I looked at it. But I was listening to it the other day, I just wanted to talk about this a little bit. It's a fun record. and. Those of you who know me know I love jazz guitar. Jazz guitar is a very accessible form of jazz that pretty much anybody can dig into and enjoy. Uh, it's not going to really ever get too edgy out there, too bright. It's always going to be very smooth and have a lot of groove and, and form to it. Uh, he, he's not one of the guys that people think of first, like the Grant Greens and the Kenny Burrells and the West Montgomery's. He's a more of a hidden factor. But he does do a couple of records with Coleman Hawkins at Prestige in the late 50s. 
that are outstanding, which is how I knew about them first. And I picked up a few other Tiny Grimes over the years that are great. But this United Artists record is fantastic. And if you remember, United Artists is, is a film company. And they launched a record label to do some soundtracks. And they decided to do a jazz division. Because in 58, 59, when they're thinking about all this, jazz was still a fairly big force. But by 60s, when they actually kind of launch it and get the whole label going, jazz is about to be wiped off the face of the commercial map. And so United Artists time making jazz records, it, it, there's, they still do stuff, you know, but I think a lot of people made record label decisions in the 50s, not seeing what was coming in the 60s, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, I think it's a bit like how the CD era came to this crashing in when the digital age came in. The labels didn't really see that coming. And I don't think they saw jazz. Would Impulse have launched if they knew the Beatle invasion was right around the corner? I think in 59, when Impulse is considering all of this and Creed Taylor's talking them into it, there was probably still some belief that jazz was or gonna could have a comeback and become a major selling force again. And kind of blew in 59 and Time Out Brubeck. Those records sold well. And so I think executives were still thinking jazz could still have this big resurgence and like disco once the sales stopped they really stopped and disco was of course reborn in electronic music that dance club beat came right back in house music the detroit chicago sound and europe fell in love with techno and, and house music and it's essentially disco producer driven music that's danceable and jazz does that face say face ugh, say face the same face that was tough to say jazz faces the same fate as disco where it kind of comes to a screeching halt and it does, it is reborn in other vernaculars but it never really gets back into the mainstream just like house and disco uh, house and techno never does that here you know once in a while a song will cross over to the charts but those forms never became popular in america to the same degree where they really dominated the European charts and most of the world, to be honest. But, uh, and jazz likewise has more popularity than most of the rest of the world than it does here as well, which is also a great sadness for me. But, uh, Tiny Grimes is a great player. It's a record worth finding and looking for. But, uh, the most important, I just wanted to talk about what is jazz and, and how do we define it? And I think it's okay to approach, approach it from every, any way you've come to it. But I think it's important to recognize at some point that this is a tearing down of a system, an oppression against tyranny. It's, it's, it's the voice of a group of people pissing on your wall. Nah. Nah. You can't build this temple on the backs of the blood of my people and not have me piss on it. You know what I mean? My people's blood is in the foundations of your temples. I, I, I'm spray painting some shit on that. You got your little fancy musicals. That's great. And you know what? People love them shits. Watch how they love them when I do. I'm going to fuck them up. And, then, and jazz does. Jazz reinvents that music and makes it so much better. And there's a reason why America danced to it for four, four decades. It was the party music of the nation. People were celebrating their own monuments being pissed on. And most people didn't even recognize it because they were so ignorant. They didn't really know the monument or the piss. But uh, history really is an important text, texture to understanding this body of work and it's something I touch on sometimes and I'll do dive deeper into it at times but I know I get new subscribers all the time so I want to reflect on that stuff and keep it in people's minds you know jazz isn't a powerful psalms and proverbs it's, it's you you watch this music will have a staying power that will outlive all the pop music all the rock music all the hippity hoppity hippity hoppity this music will have a voice 2,000 years from now and be an important thing. 
And I think Bob Marley will also be an important thing. The Beatles and Bob Dylan will probably be important things. I think most of the rest of it will be much more diminished in time. Only the real innovators, the real shakers and movers are going to have that vehicle of time re remember them. And jazz is such an interesting time post. And I don't think the children of Israel, as they searched the wilderness, thought some people were going to be celebrating their written resistance to oppression four or 5,000 years later. If you had tried to write it in that context, it wouldn't have worked. But history has a way of finding the art of the oppressed because there's such a power in it, such a message. And it just transcends. All of us finds an audience. And jazz will continue to find an audience. Check out my Patreon page, pledge support if you can. Uh, go to my Teespring page, which you'll see in the comments below the links, and grab some merchandise. There's some for the Facebook groups. There's some for the Jazz Shepherd himself. Uh, appreciate you all. Y'all stay safe out there. Stay warm. I got warmth in here, so I ain't cold for the first time making a video in two weeks. Uh, now we gotta get the air conditioning figured out. One hill at a time. But hopefully we'll have people visiting here in the lounge by 2021 when all this kind of, who knows, 2020. Hindsight. Talk to you soon. Peace.